Good morning, everybody, and Happy New Year. Since my Christmas special was a success, and a whole bunch of you have written me, because you would like to hear a little bit more about what the Vikings actually believed in, well, I will do my New Year's special about the Vikings, because, well, they're kind of cool, but not really the Vikings, more about the Nordic traditions, where do they come from, who were they? You've asked me who my, why my favorite god is Tua, and who and how and Odin and Thor related, and how did it all came to be. So I will break down as quick and simply and painfully uh, pronouncing some of these names as I can for you, but this is generally the cliff notes of North mythology. And afterwards we will have a little bit of an editorial about what's happening on this channel next year, so please stay tuned for that. Now in North mythology, there are nine worlds. They're all held together by the giant Ask tree, Uktrasil. Now these realms are all home to different kinds of beings, such as an Asgard is home of the gods, or Jutenheim, which is home of the giants. The first two realms, Niflheim and Muspelheim, was created out of the Grundenab. The rest of the realms were created out of Mia's body by Odin and his two brothers during the creation of the world. And it's not a coincidence that there's nine realms. Number nine is very important in North mythology. You have Niflheim, the realm of fog and mist. It is the darkest and coldest region of all the realms. In it, the eldest spring in the world, called Vilikimia, is located and it is protected by a huge dragon called Nilhok. You then have Muspelheim, the land of fire. It was created at the same time as Niflheim, but it was created so far to the south of the world that it is a burning hot place filled with lava and flames and sparks. It is the home of the giants, fire demons, and is ruled by the giant Suto. Then in the middle of the world, high up in the sky, is Asgard, ruled by Odin and his brothers, and this is where all the gods and goddesses they live and rule from. Then you have Midgard, the home of the human beings, you and I. This is where we live. It is connected to Asgard with a bridge by frost, and it is surrounded by a huge ocean that is impassable. Then you have Jotunheim, the home of the giants. They are the sworn enemy of the Asia, which is Odin's people. Jotunheim consists mostly of rocks, wilderness, it's dense forest. There's no fertile lands in Jotunheim, so they live off most of the animals in the forests and the fish from the rivers. Then you have Vanaheim, which is home of the Vanir. They are the Vanir gods, the gods of the good old branch of gods. The Vanirs are masters of sorcery and magic. They are widely acknowledged for their talent to predict the future. Nobody knows exactly where the land Vanheim is located, or even what it looks like. At the end of the Asia Vanir War, the three Vanirs, Njord, Fry, and Freya, moved to Asgard as a token of peace. Then you have Elfheim, which is home of the Light Elves. It's right next to Asgard in heaven. The Light Elves are beautiful creatures. They are considered the guardian angels. The god Frey is the ruler of Elfheim. The Light Elves are minor gods of nature and fertility. They can help or hinder humans with their knowledge and magic powers. The Elves are also known for inspiring poets, art and music. Sounds like a bunch of hippies. Then you have Shvat Alfheim home of the dwarves. They live under rocks, caves, and underground. Hedima was a king of Schwadalfheim until he was killed. Schwadalfheim means dark fields. The dwarves are masters of craftsmanship, and the gods of Asgard have received many powerful gifts, for instance, the magic ring Dranipia and Gungnir, Odin's spear. Then, of course, you have Helheim, the home of the dishonorable dead. Hell is where those who are dead without honor, thieves, murderers, and those the gods and goddesses do not feel brave enough to go to Valhalla. This is where they go. Helheim is ruled over by Hel, one of Loki's daughters, and guarded by the hellhound Gjellm. Helheim is a very grim and cold place, and when people arrive here they will never feel joy or happiness again. It is these unfortunate dead 
that will be used at Ragnarok by Hel to attack the gods and goddesses on the plains of Yggdrid at Ragnarok. Before there was nothing. It all started with a giant chasm called Ginurigap. It was bound on both sides. There was the world of fire that was known as Muspelheim and on the other side there was a world of ice called Niflheim. And when fire and ice met, they combined to form a giant which was called Ymir. They also formed a cow named uh, Adunumbra. She nourished Ymir. He lived from her milk and her udders. And the cow, she survived by licking the icy stones for salt. And in doing so, she uncovered another figure, Bua. Bua, he eventually had three children with the giant woman, Bestla. Bestla and Bua are the parents to Odin and his two brothers, Vila and V. Now, Odin, Vila, and V, together, they killed Yamiya. The story never really tells why they did so, but that murder created an eternal struggle between um, Asana and Vanana, uh, although Odin was part of both. Now, from Yamiya's body, they created the whole world as we know it, and from two pieces of driftwood, they created man, where Odin gave them life, and his brothers gave them thought, understanding, and sight. So, a little bit of a reference to the story of creation, except here, Odin did it. Now, from Ymir's body, they created the world as we know it. Ymir's blood was the sea, his flesh was the earth, his skull and brains became the sky, his bones the mountain his hair, the trees, and from Ymir's eyebrows were used to fence in the area in Midgard where mankind live. Now, in the rivers around Midgard, there's a giant serpent that was so vast that it would ring all of the world and it bite onto his own tail. From Ymir's dead body grew the tree of Yggdrasil, from which branched out and held all the nine worlds. The branches covered the known world and supported the universe. Yggdrasil had three roots, going each to the three levels of the world. Three springs supplied with water. One root went to Asgard, the home of the gods. Another went into the land of the giants, Jotunheim. The third went to the primeval world of ice, darkness, and the dead, known as Niflheim. In Jotunheim, a spring lay where all the wisdom of the world was gathered. It was guarded by Mima, an ancient giant. We'll get back to him. In Niflheim, the spring nourished the adder, Nidhoga, which gnawed at the root of Yggdrasil forever and ever. There was an eagle in the branches of the tree with no name, and a squirrel, Ratatosk, that continuously ran between the serpent gnawing at the roots and the eagle gossiping to each one about the other. Sort of causing constant stride. And don't get me started on how much I really don't like squirrels anymore since they ate my patio furniture. However, moving on. Between the nine worlds lay Bifrost, also known to man as the rainbow. This was guarded by Heimdall. He had a giant horn called the yellow horn. When he blew it, it could be heard in all nine worlds. He had perfect sight and hearing both in darkness and light. He would blow the horn when the enemies of Asgard would approach. And of course, in Asgard, a beautiful city created by Odin and his brothers, Odin lived in Odin's hall, Valhalla. Now to understand Odin, it is, he's an interesting and complex person, or god, sorry. He spent his entire life searching for knowledge and wisdom because it had been foretold that there would eventually be a Ragnarok, a, uh, find the end, the destruction of the worlds, where the ice and fire giants with the Vanna would attack uh, Valhalla, would attack Asgard, and the gods would have to have a final uh, battle. Uh, 
the eternal battle between good and evil would come, in which it was foreseen that Odin would die. So he spent his entire life searching for wisdom, talking to people, uh, obtaining as much knowledge as he could from everywhere and everyone, and he took on different shapes and disguises. His favorite was that of a gaunt old man with a blue cape, and he always had his favorite spear with him. He also had, for that reason, Valkyries, and they were working for Odin by traveling the battlefields in Midgard to pick the bravest of the warriors who died in battle and bring them to Valhalla because, again, everything Odin did was in preparation of that final stand. It almost seems that Odin had foreseen the Alamo and was preparing for it because it was inevitable. That's why the bravest and most hardest fighting and those Odin seemed worthy were brought to Valhalla that they could stand with the gods and fight uh, the final battle. Also, I uh, don't think there would be any peace being a brave warrior in death because the warrior's wives were allowed to follow. Now the Valkyries would travel with their shields and swords the battlefields and they could pick those they favored and protect them or they could pick those they didn't favor and have them slain. Of course, those died unworthy would eventually go down to hell and see her. We'll get back to her in a minute. The Valkyries could ride the skies, the earth, the battlefields, and the sea, which is why a lot of uh, seafaring people, they would also pray for the protection of the Valkyries as they were in charge of life and death. There's also stories of Valkyries that were part man, uh, human. <laughs> oh, discrimination. Um, and yes, all the Vero theories were women, so men need not apply. And do not think that I have not written a script about a Valkyrie falling in love with a GI in Afghanistan, because I totally have. The Valkyries are these beautiful women that were associated with fairness, brightness, uh, gold, good, and also with bloodshed, because they would always be seen traveling the battlefields to come, or as they happened. But they had a lot of power. Odin had two ravens that constantly traveled and followed with him, Hugin and Mugin, uh, which translates to thought and mind, metaphorically, just a little, I'm sure. Each morning, they would travel the nine worlds, they would see and hear all that happened, and in the evening, they would come back and sit on Odin's shoulders and tell him all they had seen and heard. He also had two wolves that constantly sat by his feet, Gia and Freke, which roughly translates both to greedy. Um, Odin would not eat. He would nourish himself by wine and mead alone. So whenever he was given food, he would immediately give it to the wolves to eat. I guess that's where their nickname came from. Odin had a magic spear named Hunga. Could not be stopped by anything or anyone and it would never miss its target or its enemies. It was a gift from Loki, which we'll get back to in a minute. He also had an eight-legged horse, Schlepnir, which was his amazing steed that could fly and ride, strongest horse of them all, which incidentally also has an interesting story because it may be that the father or mother to Schlepnir is also Loki. Loki we'll get to because he's just as interesting as Odin. There's a time where Odin had left on his quest for knowledge and was away from Asgard so long that the gods thought he would never return, and they split the kingdom between them and married his wife. However, Odin did return, took his wife back, but so was Odin, always sacrificing himself in many ways in order to obtain knowledge. Once his two brothers, Vila and Vi, had disappeared, and no one knew where they were. He asked Ratatorsk if he'd seen them, and they had not. The eagle had not seen him. So finally he went down to the Well of Wisdom and asked Mima for information. Since Mima knew everything that had happened everywhere, but he wouldn't tell. Odin asked for a drink from the Well of Wisdom that he may learn what happened to his brothers, but Mima wouldn't give it to him, at least not outright. So he dared him with something he thought he would never accept. He would, in exchange for one of Odin's eyes, let him drink from the Well of Wisdom. 
Odin tore out his eye and threw it in the well that he could drink from the well. However, once the eye was in the water, it saw and knew everything and Odin could still see with it. There's a little magic going on in these realms. Go with it. That's why Odin only had one eye. Now, he never told what happened to his brothers. He never shared it with anyone. Mimon was sent to guard the well and tried to bring peace between Esona and Vanona. Didn't work out too well because Vanona cut his head off. Odin rescued the head and kept it alive with secret potions and herbs and Mimon's head was now sitting in Valhalla next to Odin that he would always share with its wisdom. Wednesday is named after Odin because in Denmark Wednesday or in Scandinavia is called Onsday, Odinsday, Odinsday. Don't know how it came to be Wednesday, but go with it. Wednesday is the day for Odin. Then we have Frigg, which was uh, Odin's hot wife. Frigg was every bit of Odin's equal, and they shared in the same knowledge, but she didn't put it to much use. She kept it to herself, except for the one time where her son, Beldur, was had been foretold his death was coming. In which case, she went to all things. She First, she went to hell to have her, it's a woman that is protecting the gates of hell, you get back to it, to protect, pr uh, promise that she would not take his soul in exchange for her traveling to the, throughout all worlds and making all things promise they would do no harm to her son. The only thing she forgot was the mistletoe. She did try to influence affairs that way. She's also the goddess that uh, mothers would pray to for protection of their sons, especially if their sons were going to war. Odin and Frigg had three children, Thor, Vela, and Belda. Thor, as you have all heard about, not even going to talk about Thor because this day and age you should know who he is. And you should certainly hear when it thunders and his chariot pulled by two fierce goats. Now, don't get me wrong, Odin also had a couple of other children with other women, because that was acceptable. Although it really wasn't acceptable for the Vikings, where adultery was not really seen upon favorably. Interestingly enough, Friday is the day that's named after Frigg. You'll see that all weekdays are named after the Norse gods. And then eventually, there was only five to begin with, Eventually, a few more uh, was tagged on when Christianity uh, and Norse uh, culture met. Now, Odin's other sons, outside of marriage, was Heda, Hermon, and possibly the god Tyr. Now, Tyr we don't know that much about. We are not entirely sure if he is one of Odin's sons or how he is a contemporary. There's relatively little known about him initially except he was incredibly brave and he and Thor had quite a few adventures together including trying to obtain a giant vat where they could have in enough uh, ale uh, or uh, whatever they're drinking mead for all the gods in Asgard and it was said that Thor could lift it but Tyr couldn't so Thor was a bit stronger, but he was one of the strongest gods in, uh, in Asgard. But Tyr is interesting. One thing we do know about him is his grandmother had 900 heads, which is interesting, I'll say. Don't know if that has anything to do with Medusa. Never mind moving on different culture. Tyr is often compared to the Roman god uh, Mars as the god of war, but he really isn't. Tyr was the god of justice and protection, and he would safeguard mankind. He would sacrifice his arm uh, to protect uh, mankind and all the gods at Asgard. He also had a wife that got knocked up by Loki, which caused quite some consternation uh, that we know of, and Tyr was eventually... Well, you know what, let's uh, save that one till at the end, because he is by far my favorite god. He is the god, if you were a lawyer, 
you would pray to the god Tuo, because he was the god of justice and overseer of the safeguarding of mankind. So, having spent my life, a uh, large part of my life, as a bodyguard and personal protection, I always liked the god Tuo. And that's why, because he would stand with the Fenris wolf, the wolf from hell, and safeguard the world until the day of Ragnarok. And I'm not entirely sure how Fenris and my golden retriever would kind of match up, but I'm sure when Buddy looked himself in the mirror, that's what he saw. And since a lot of these stories, we start talking about Loki. Loki is an interesting, very interesting god, and you've all heard about him, you've probably seen some of the movies, and he's not entirely wrongly depicted in a lot of them. He was the trickster god. He was an Aesir like Odin, and a lot of the sagas, it, it's a little hard to see where he fits in, where he came from. Initially, in the early 800s, 900s, stories had been foretold that he was, he was part of Odin, as if maybe he was another brother of Odin, maybe he was a son of Odin. It's a little unclear where he came from. But certainly he was a powerful god, and he always played tricks on everybody. Sometimes he would side with the gods, and sometimes he would oppose them. Loki would play tricks on everybody, and there is a well-known story about how he convinced uh, Thor's wife uh, to, to shave her head, and Thor did not find that even remotely amusing, and before pundling him to death, he promised to get the uh, dwarves to make her a new head of hair made of gold that would work like a normal hair. And like I said, he also uh, took on different shapes and he knocked up uh, Tua's wife and made fun of that. Um, he did interesting things and he could take on different shapes, any shape he wanted to, and the different species. Like I said, he became, he took on a shape of the mare that gave birth to Schlepnia, Odin's horse. And several times in the sagas, he would save uh, Thor in different ways. He also gave uh, Odin his famous spear, Hungnia. Now, Loki, as we can sort of tell from all this mischief he keeps causing, eventually he would finally piss off everybody to the point where things go sideways. And indeed they do, however. First, also everybody's having children with everybody here, and as Loki had the ability to change shapes, and well, you had a lot of uh, crossbreeding going on. Loki sired three or maybe four children with a giant woman, Angreboda, from Jutenheim. The serpent uh, Jungmund's god, or which is known as the Milgors Ormen in Denmark. A girl that became Hel, the guardian of the lower realm of the dead. And Fenris, the enormous wolf that would eventually devour the world, or was foretold to do so. Now with these three interesting spawn of uh, Loki, everything is being foretold. So Odin sent for the three, the giant serpent, the girl, and the wolf. And the giant serpent... <laughs> Jormund's order. We'll just call him uh, Milgors Ormen. That's what I would call him. Odin took him and threw him into the sea. He took the girl, Hel, and sent her to Niflheim, where he gave her authority over the nine worlds. And she became the guardian of Hel. Hel. We've heard about her before. Now, then we come to Fenris the giant wolf. Odin thought it would be a great idea, now you got to imagine, he's still a little puppy at this point, that Odin would raise him himself, despite what has been foretold, that one day Fenris would devour Odin. He brought Fenris up at Asgard. However, it was pretty soon noticed by the Aesir that Fenris grew rather large and rather fast. And, well, he was wander around Asgard eating everything and everybody, and uh, that started becoming a little bit of a dangerous situation, have this ginormous wolf that would, you know, see everybody as lunch. 
So they tried to bind him. And they tried all sorts of things to bind Fenris. They tried enormous chains. They tried everything that was tied him to mountains and nothing was successful. Fenris would just laugh at them and break whatever shackles they had wrapped him with. He's also a talking wolf. Forgot to mention that. Anyway. After trying all sorts of things, they gave up and they finally went to the land of the Svathalfarheimah to the dwarves, and they had him make him a rope, Glepnia. It was rope made from a whole lot of potion and magic, and they invited Fenris to the island Lungnia, where they offered for him to be bound by this rope. Now, this was a fine, small, silky string. Remember, it was made by magic. But Fenris wasn't really impressed, and he looked at them. As they stood there with their fine little silky rope, that they dared him to be bound with, and he said, It looks to me that with this ribbon, as though I will gain no fame from it, if I do tear it apart, such a slender band. But if it's made with art of trickery, then even if it does look so thin, this band is not going on my legs. Now the Essia tried to trick Fenris, and said to him, Fenris, you will quickly tear this thin, silky strip apart. No, I mean, everything we have tied Fenris with before has broken even great iron bands. And they added that if Fenris wasn't able to break this slender, thin, silky strand of rope, then Fenris really wasn't anything that the gods need to worry about. And he was not to be swayed that easy. So he said, If you bind me so that I am unable to release myself, then you will be standing by in such a way that I should have to wait a long time before I get any help from you. I am reluctant to have this put on me. But rather than you question my courage, let someone put his hand in my mouth as a pledge this is done in good faith. Now, with that, the SEO started looking a little bit concerned to one another because here's a dilemma. They were not going to untie Fenris and they really did not want to put their hand in his mouth. However, forward steps Tua, my favorite god, and puts his hand in the mouth of the giant wolf. So here we get with a bravery, and there's a lot of bravery and sacrifice going on in Valhalla, just letting you know. He would put his hands in the wolf's jars, and when Fenris kicked Glebnia, the rope caught tightly. And the more Fenris struggled, the stronger the band grew. At this, everyone laughed, except Tua who had just lost his hand. Now the gods knew the Fenris was finally bound. They took the cord, inserted the cord through a large stone slab called Gül, and the god fastened it to the stone slab deep in the ground. And here Fenris will lie until Ragnarok. Ragnia, he commented that Loki did create a pretty terrible family. Now, it's interesting again why Loki kept playing tricks with people and the gods, and things really go south when, after remember, um, Odin's wife had made all things but the mistletoe promise they would do no harm to her son Baldur, which was the most loved and beautiful of them all up in uh, Asgard. What happened then was Loki took on a different figure. They, they made light of the fact that Baldur couldn't be harmed by anything. So the gods made it a sport to shoot arrows at him and they would just bounce off. Except the mistletoe that had been forgotten. And Loki had one of Odin's other sons who was blind. He would guide him to shoot an arrow of mistletoe at Baldur, killing him instantly. Such was the sorrow that Fry sent uh, Odin's sons to hell to release her, her son's soul to bring Baldur back. Now, Hel promised to do this if she could make all creatures of the kingdom and the nine realms cry for Baldur. And she did, except she came to a giant in a cave that was actually Loki in disguise who refused to cry for Baldur, leaving him in Hell for eternity. Or, well, not entirely. Now, for this, Odin punished uh, Loki. This was where he crossed the line. And his punishment was severe. 
the guards chained him in a cave in the mountain in Jutenheim. Here he would stand with millstones around his, his neck, his stomach and his knees so he could not move. Here in this cave, Loki would live without anything to eat and dry, tied up. But the Vals would make sure that he couldn't, couldn't escape and break his chain. So they brought his two sons to the cave, Nafti and Vale. They were known to always fight. And they wouldn't commit murder of, still, the children of a god. So they turned Vale into a wolf and waited for them to fight, which they eventually did. For Vale, not knowing his wolfly strength, would tear Nafti apart. They would then use the intestines of Nafta to tie up Loki that he could never get away. Then on top of that, they put a poisonous serpent on Loki's head. Now Loki had a devout and loving wife, uh, Sigun, and she loved him so much she followed him to the cave and stands next to him with a vat, catching the, um, the poison from the serpent before it hits his head. Sometimes when the vat is too full and she needs to empty it, the poison will drip on Loki's head and he will shiver and shake. And that's where earthquakes come from. I guess denoting that Loki would still be chained up in this cave in the mountain, although he escapes at Ragnarok. Spoiler alert. And at the end of it all is Ragnarok, the end of times. It starts with three winters, internal night and day and summer and winter all become frozen before the ice giants and the fire giants finally march with Ivana against Asgard where Heimdall will blow his horn warning the approach of danger. Tyr will eventually be killed by Glam, Fenris's brother who is guarding the entrance to hell. Fenris will break his chains and do battle with Odin and will finally eat and kill Odin. Fenris will then in turn be killed by Odin's son. It will all end in one large fiery hell from which mankind will survive and live today. All the ancient gods will die during uh, Ragnarok, but their sons, their children will live and Baldur will come back from hell. So this is where we are today. <clears throat> And that makes it interesting because I could go into a lot of details about exactly how the Battle of Ragnarok happens, but that's for another episode. The Vikings believed in these gods. They would adorn their ships and their weapons and their houses with rune stones. Runes had different meanings and were calling for the protections and the safeguarding of these gods, which, if you had believed in Ragnarok had happened, all these gods were already dead, but their sons and daughters were still living. It would be expected there would be another Ragnarok to come. And that's why you've seen during World War II, especially uh, the Germans having a new resurgence of interest in North mythology, you've seen uh, runes painted on tanks and weapons, and you see them on Christmas trees today. Um, there's a lot of interesting parallels between uh, North mythology and what is celebrated in Christianity because it all sort of became a mix-up. There's a lot of parallels between the ancient Viking gods and the Greek gods and the Roman gods. And mm, there's also a lot of parallels between Vikings and bikers of today. Vikings, they love to bling out their horses and wear great shiny clothes and you see these bristles for horses that are silver or gold or copper just like you see um, the bearded bikers on their chromy Harleys. I don't exactly know but I'm pretty sure that the Vikings descendants today would be um, the Harley crowd and I'm not growing a beard so just not gonna happen sorry like me. <laughs> That's the creation that Vikings believed in back in the day in the cliff note version and if you want the breakdown of uh, Ragnarok and how that happened and ended I'll do that in another episode but you're gonna have to ask for that one. What I wanted to talk to you all about is next year 2021 and what you expect to see on this channel. Now I went to visit uh, some amazing forts out on uh, the Maginot Line, Fort Ibn Amal up in Czechia uh, I dug around uh, forests in Germany um, near Sussen, 
and my back complex has found my back too, that supposedly is destroyed. All that is coming at you regardless. Now after that, I'm going back out to Europe uh, in a couple of months. I'm still putting together and finalizing the episodes of The Last Nazi Secret. There's some interviews I need to do. And you are all being inflicted with commercials uh, here on, especially on YouTube, because, well, I don't have any sponsors. There's no network behind me. I don't have any video games paying my way. So it is all my money that I earn when I go to work and do whatever it is I do. I'm not entitled clearly on that yet. And then from the commercial revenue. So when you see the episodes all the way through, um, that is where I get the money to go travel. And it's not really that much. It's not exactly dime to a dollar. And I would love to do some of these with lesser commercials. I would love your feedback about are there too many commercials? Because when I activate them, I don't really have much say in how many or where they are. Um, I had been approached by several people who thought I needed to set up uh, PayPal accounts or Patreon. I have a Patreon, but I really don't know how it works. I'm not very good at asking for money. And I never really wanted to do that. This is something I would like to do and bring to you, and especially those of you who have written me that uh, or, or veterans or disabled or older and can't go to the places I go to. Uh, I do it for you, and I'm really happy that I can bring a lot of these historical places to you. And that's why some of the walkthroughs really are walkthroughs that would be the best. I could never do that for a network. A network want 44 or... 88 minute blocks of, of highlights, but here on YouTube I can give you the full length of whatever battlefield you would like me to go to, which is pretty much only limited by uh, imagination and funding, because traveling around the world costs a bit of money. I will take your suggestions and advice on should I set up a PayPal for this? Um, and if there's for specific episodes or specific places you would like me to go see, um, should I do more work on the Patreon? It's not really anything I ever really thought of, but I'll take your lead for this because I'm doing it for you. And obviously, the more well, the more money I make in every which way in relation to this, uh, the more money I'll have to go to places that you suggest I go to and would like to see. The one thing you can do to uh, help me, short of finding um, millionaires with nothing better to do than send me endless streams of money to travel around the world, would be a lot of your historians, a lot of your reenactors, uh, a lot of you have an interest in, in what I do. Share my videos on as many platforms as you can. Uh, share with your friends, share on your, on your uh, Facebooks and uh, wherever you can put up links, that would help me because the more followers I get, the more commercial revenue I get, and the less I have to go out in work, uh, in my day job, to travel sporadically, and the more I can, uh, I can go to these places. And that would be very helpful if you would all help me share the channel, or the Lost Battlefields, or even the website, lostbattlefields.com. Uh, to as many people as you can, uh, hopefully if I get many more uh, hundreds of thousands of views or millions of views, uh, the more I get, the more I make, the more I can travel, and the more I can bring to you without uh, getting to the point where I would have to actually uh, ask for active support, which is something it really rubs me the wrong way of doing. But uh, still, I, I can't uh, work a day job and uh, Filming, as you can tell, you know I make movies as well, and filming in this year, uh, we're just finishing off a war movie called uh, Iron Cross. It's been, uh, because of everything that's going on, there's not been a whole lot of that going on. Um, it is what it is. Next year, we, we have one or two movies I expect to do, again, because of what's going on, funding is up and down. but. Traveling around uh, Europe, I would like to go to uh, Russia and to Ukraine, the Baltics. Again, takes a bit of funding. I'm going back out to Ebenemal, back out to Maginot Line, 
uh, in a few months back out to Poland, done, not done in Lower Silesia, not done in, in Czechoslovakia or Czechia, not done in Austria. So I have to go out there and I read all your suggestions. I try to respond to every one of your mails or comments. You can also mail me directly with ideas, uh, Tino Strokeman at hotmail.com or uh, uh, <laughs> military history QA at mail.com. And I really value all your input and keep sending me questions. And if I can't answer them, I hope I will have a collaboration with Drake this year. And if you're into naval history, you definitely want to uh, visit his channel because he is an amazing historian. I'm hopefully also going to go uh, look-see around uh, Europe with uh, World War II History Hunter and hopefully a few others. And for one of you guys that made something uh, from one of my movies and sent me, I want to share with you. It's a little hard. It's, um, it's a mirror with a uh, depiction of one of the uh, scenes from the Arden Fury movie that I did of, of my character there and I absolutely I absolutely love that I gotta frame it and put it on the wall so the little knickknacks are totally worth it and given the travel situation restrictions in 2021 I hope to start arranging tours and trips a couple of times a year uh, around Europe from East Wall uh, East Prussia Lower Silesia uh, France Germany Belgium to see some of all these forts. Also, it's more fun when we're 10 or 20 dudes uh, or girls uh, together digging through places. And um, I figure looking at two week trips uh, and I, maybe a couple of thousand dollars should be able to do it, cover food and, and hotel and everything. Won't be luxury hotels, but we're there to look at history. And if you have an interest in those trips, I'm going to try to put it together in the next couple of months and put up a rough schedule and see if I can, uh, if we're enough to sign up and let's go travel around because it's out there and it's amazing to experience on your own to be in places where these things have really happened, whatever these things are. And it's only a flight away. So it's definitely a reason to renew your passport because sooner or later we can get out there and things are a bit cheaper in the Eastern Europe than they are in Western Europe. Anyway, you have an amazing new year and I will see you in the next year. And the great fort from Norway is coming up in a few days, starting that series. I'll see you then. Be safe. Happy New Year. Be well and fire a lot of rockets. <laughs>